Now, I just, I don't be afraid. Um, uh, this is an axe. Yeah, for any of you really hardcore city slickers. That's what this is. How, how many of you have actually swung an axe before? Can you, can you put your hands up high? So basically everyone in this place. Um, well, when I was a kid, I want to tell you kind of a story about, about my growing up. And don't worry, the head of this thing is secure, and no matter how much I throw it around, it's not going to hurt you. But I promise, I, I, pro- I won't swing it around too much. When I was a kid, I lived in the middle of nowhere, up, up on a mountain. And you've heard me tell these stories about kind of where I grew up and, and what that means for me now as an adult, realizing just how redneck my family was. But when I was growing up, we lived in a house that was wood-heated, which means that this bad boy was the thing that heated our house all winter long. Now, in southern BC, our winters weren't quite as bad as they are here, but they were still long, and they were still cold, and you needed to heat your house. And so what every fall, we would gather wood. But I want to tell you a quick story before we go any further. Um, when I was about 15 years old, this is kind of embarrassing, so I, I want to, some of you know this story already. Um, when I was 15 years old, I was hanging out with my good friend, Daryl Hoffman. And uh, Daryl lived in the town, and he lived in, a, in a, like a normal house. Um, and I was hanging out with him, and we were playing Sega Genesis, uh, Sonic the Hedgehog, back in the day. And, yeah, thank you, one other old person in the room. Uh, so we were playing Sonic, and he looked at me, we were in his basement, and he said, Luke, are, are you cold? And I was like, yeah, yeah, I'm a little, little chilly. And he said, all right, cool. And he, so he, he got up, and he walked to the wall, and on the wall there was this little white box with a little thing that hung down, and he moved the little hanging thing, and then he returned to his seat and sat down beside me, and very perplexed, I looked at Daryl, and I said, well, what did you just do? Uh, And he said, "Uh, I turned up the heat, like I'm the idiot. (laughs) I'm like, uh, how does that work? He's like, what do you mean, how does that work? I was like, well, like the thing, like what, how, does that, how does that make the house warmer? He's like, I don't know. He's like, it turns the furnace up. I was like, what's a furnace? <laughs> and he's like, I don't know, Luke, go ask my dad. He's a loser. So I go upstairs and I get Cal, his dad. And I said, Cal, what's a furnace? And he's like, what? I said, what's a furnace? Like, what is this thing, this contraption you speak of? Can I see it? And he's like, you're a weird kid, but sure. So we go down into the basement, and we go into the mechanical room, and he opens it up, and there's this furnace-looking thing. Who, you guys know what a furnace is? Okay, it's this big metal box-looking thing. And, and so I'm looking at it, and I'm looking all around it, and he goes, what are you doing? And I said, I'm just trying to figure out where the wood goes. <laughs> and he goes, wood, it's, it's, it's natural gas. So what's natural gas? I was so confused. I had no idea what this thing was. And so I I find out, in case you don't know, that when you move that little thing, it tells something in the furnace to to, get hotter and then blow air through the house. And this blew my mind. It absolutely rocked my world. And I went home, and I'm I'm, I'm, I'm not overstating it when I say I was really angry. Because I went in the house and I asked my parents, I said, do you know what a furnace is? And they looked at me like I had repeated the third grade too many times. And they said, of course we know what a furnace is, you dummy. And I was like, why don't we have one? Because, I, go, can you go to the next slide? I want to show you something that was a regular occurrence in my house. This is what's known as a cord of wood. So I, every Every single year, we would, get, we would get loads of wood. Can you go to the next slide quick, too? Actually, I want to show you this. How many people had those roll up in their front yards? Yeah, one of you. Owen oh, back there, my fellow BC brother, Stephen. Um, that was a regular occurrence. That wasn't actually one of our trucks, but that was exactly. It's called a seven-axle logging truck. And they would pull up, and they would, they would unload. They were self-pickers, so they would unload. And that was... That was our wood for the winter. Can you just go back to the last slide? And basically, every year, we would, we would chop wood. And when I say we, I mean me. 
can I, I need four volunteers. Can I get four volunteers? Just, just come right up to the front of the stage here. Come on, I need three more. Let's go. I'm not going to make you do anything crazy. I just need you to stand in one spot. And two more. I need somebody from over here. Come on. Come on. Okay, there, okay, here we go. So I want you to come over here. I want you to stand right here. Just, st just stand real... St yes, yeah, just stand there. Josiah, you come back here. And you stand right here. Okay, you come with me. And you too, come on. Matt, you go up there. Go stand in front of this stand here. And you come back here, stand right here. Kind of in line. Okay, this is approximately 32 feet by 12 feet. We have a, we have a big stage. So every single winter in my house, we would use 12 cords of wood to heat our home. 12 cords. Now a cord, in case you don't know, is what you see on the screen. It's 8 feet long by 4 feet wide by 4, four feet tall. That is one uh, measurement of a cord. I don't know if it's imperial, imperial or whatever it is. But this is approximately 32 feet wide by 12 feet deep. Now imagine this piled with this high of chopped wood. This whole area. That's what we would use in a winter time. And that's what yours truly had to chop with an axe just like that. Okay? Thank you guys. Can we give our, our helpers a round of applause? Thank you for helping us visualize. Now just to put it into perspective, one cord of Douglas fir, which is what we tended to use, weighs about 3,000 pounds. So every winter I would chop approximately 36,000 pounds of wood. Now you wonder why I'm so big. It's residual effect from swinging an axe that many times. And I can tell you that each chunk of wood, now this is a very small piece of wood. Most, most of the trees we would get would be about this big around or bigger. And so you would get about six or eight chops out of it if it was dry. And if it was wet, you would just pound and pound and pound of this thing. And it, just, it, would, it was terrible. And so I want to tell you all of this because I want you to see and get an idea that I chopped a lot of wood. A lot of wood. I am not, I'm not one to brag very much in my life. And this is a really weak flex. So you can take it for what it is. But like, I am really good with an axe. I would venture to say I'm probably better than an axe, or with an axe than, than any of you in this room. I have chopped hundreds of thousands of pounds of wood. I have chopped hundreds of cords of wood in my life. All with an axe that looked exactly like this. We did have some that were a little bit bigger. But what I found is, is when I was younger, I remember one day I was chopping wood. And it was just piles, you guys. Like, I just, you don't understand. Like, my dad would bring in big truckloads of wood, and it would just be like a massive stack. And I would come home after school, and he would say, supper's in a couple hours, chop wood until then. And that's what I did. You all think you had it bad. So... I would chop wood, and I remember when I was young, and I was chopping, and I was chopping, and I was chopping, and, and I went inside, and I was so frustrated. I said, Dad, I was like, I, I can't chop anymore. My, finger, my hands had blisters. I was working so hard to, to, to get through this wood. And so he came out, and, and he looked at my axe, and he said, Well, Luke, your axe is so dull. My axe was so dull, the edge was completely gone. It was basically just a big, flat slab at the end of the metal and so every chop I would make was increasingly more difficult and I had to put more and more effort into each strike to get through the wood and so my dad taught me that day how to use a, a grinding stone to sharpen the edge of my axe and that brings me to my point tonight Tonight, I want us to unpack what it means to, to sharpen the axe of our lives. To, to not labor in vain, because friends, it, it's a reality that this life is full of difficulty. And, and I can promise you that the amount of effort that I had to put in when my axe was dull greatly decreased the effectiveness of each swing. But it wasn't until my axe was sharp that I was able to produce greater results and my efficiency increased. And so as you know, we've been going through the book of Daniel, and tonight we find ourselves in Daniel 3. And what's, what's interesting about this, about this chapter right up front is that Daniel's not actually in it at all. But what we see, and before we get to the verse we're going to focus on tonight, 
is we see that in this chapter, King Nebuchadnezzar sorry, had built a giant statue made of gold. The Bible tells us that it was 90 feet tall and 9 feet wide. It was, that's a very strange statue. In fact, some commentators tell us that it's more of a pillar or an obelisk, if you're familiar with that kind of language. But what I find so interesting about this is this statue was made entirely of gold. And do we remember uh, Daniel 2, when we were talking about the dream that Daniel, or the king had that Daniel interpreted? We see that the statue in that dream was made of a head of gold, and then bronze and copper, and as it moved down, iron and clay in the feet. And what I find so interesting about this story that we pick up in Daniel 3 is that the king has now made a statue, but made completely of gold. And it makes me wonder if he did this on purpose. If he did it purposely just to try to stand against the prophecy and proclaim dominion over all the land with a statue not made of mixed metals, but a a statue made entirely of pure gold. And what we see is that after construction is complete, everyone is ordered in the entire land, every single person, there's no exceptions. They were ordered at the sound of a a host of instruments to bow down and worship this tower, worship this pillar or this statue. But what we see is that just like in chapter 1, Daniel, and in this story, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused to participate in the practices of of the kingdom that they were enslaved in. And instead, they stood in contrast to what the king had asked them. And this chapter's no different. But what's interesting here is that in the first chapter where we see that the king was okay with Daniel saying, let me prove to you that my God is powerful enough. In this chapter, the king is furious. So we pick up in verse 13. Daniel chapter 3. If you have your Bibles, turn with me. It reads this, Then Nebuchadnezzar flew into a rage and ordered that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought before him. When they were brought in, Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you refuse to serve my gods or to worship the gold statue I have set up? I will give you one more chance to bow down and worship the statue I have made when you hear the sound of the musical instruments. But if you refuse, you will be thrown immediately into the blazing furnace. And then what God will be able to rescue you from my power? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you. Just pause here. Sometimes we think of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego as kind of the sidekicks of Daniel. But these guys knew what was going on. And they stood in front of the king, and they said, Oh, Nebuchadnezzar. And I don't think it was a reverent, Oh, Nebuchadnezzar. I think it was like, a, Okay, buddy, listen up. We don't need to bow before you. We don't need to defend ourselves. They say this in verse 17, if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. But even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue you set up. This is a powerful statement. This is something that should, should cause us to, to take a second and, and look at it. And I guess that's my job tonight is to, to show you why this matters. But the first thing I want you to see is that there's actually a caveat here. The word in this portion of text used for worship does not mean the same thing that we think it means. It doesn't, it doesn't mean to praise the statue as a god. See, when we read worship in the Old Testament, we think of that. We think of falling down on our knees before something and worshiping it as it is God. But that's not the case here. This word simply means to honor. And the reason why that matters is because this means that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego actually kind of had an out. You see, they could have very easily bowed down and given honor to this statue. I mean, 
let's be totally honest. If there was a 90-foot tall pure gold statue, we would all probably be like, huh, that's pretty amazing. We might even tell our friends, hey, you know what? I saw this amazing statue. It's 90 feet tall. Yeah, it's some statue to a god or about a god or something. I don't really know what it is, but, but it's amazing. You should check it out. It's set up here that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had an easy way to just say, eh, we could probably do it. But what they knew and what they were convicted of is that their honor, their respect, their attention, their focus, and ultimately their worship belonged to God and to God alone. And really this brings me to one point tonight, that conviction should be a greater motivator than fear. But we know this isn't always the truth, right? Fear causes us to run from pain. It causes us to try and evade hardship. It causes us to hide from those that we love, and ultimately it chains us down. Conviction, on the other hand, is the thing that we're willing to stake our reputations on. It's what draws us closer to our true nature and the thing that we were ultimately created for. To live in the presence and to enjoy the company of our God. You see, conviction is the essence of our beings played out on the stages of our life. It's the thing that moves us from mere hunks of flesh to created beings with purpose that are made in the image of an almighty, powerful God. The thing that that we stand secure on, the thing that causes us to wake up in the morning, the thing that drives us towards greatness is the thing that we are most convicted by. And I want you to hear this tonight. That fear establishes the boundaries of our freedom. As long as we allow fear to be in control, we'll never be free. You see, fear stands in stark opposition with our conviction. We can be convicted of something and believe that we're called to that higher purpose, but fear can strip us of that ability and that desire. Ultimately, it stands opposed to the will of God. And it creates a chasm that cannot be crossed. But I want you to hear tonight that that chasm is almost always created by us. That fear allows that gorge to be made between what we are as human beings and what God has planned for us. And as I was going through the motions of writing this sermon and and praying and reading like I always do, I talked to somebody and this person said a phrase to me that we've heard before in movies. It says, the only thing to fear is fear itself. And I thought about it, and I wrote it down. And then I just wrote two words beside it. I wrote, that's stupid. <laughs> fear itself? No. We shouldn't fear fear itself. What we should fear is what fear prevents us from accomplishing. That's what we should fear. We should fear what it stops us from doing. Because guess what? We all have something worthwhile living for. We are more than just merely existing in this world, my friends. And so we shouldn't fear fear itself. That's dumb. We should fear what fear stops us from accomplishing. Because when we allow fear to cloud our perspective, we, we merely exist. And when we forget about our convictions and instead trade them in for some mediocre representation of our potential greatness, we merely exist. And when we move from active participants with God and settle for becoming spectators of this life as it passes us by, we merely exist. And I don't know about you, but but I don't want to merely exist. I don't want to get to the end of my life and look back at my days 
and see that I settled for an extra in the film of my life when the lead role was wide open. I don't want that. Hebrews 11 begins with this. It's known as the great faith chapter of the Bible. It says, now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. And so I want to encourage you tonight that when we become convicted of something, when we become convinced that there's something more in this life worth living for than just merely existing and lowering ourselves to the status quo, and we begin to see that his ways are far greater than my ways, we begin to see the truth and the majesty of God unfold in a brilliant array of experiences that point us toward our Heavenly Father and a life that's actually worth living. And we see this very clearly in Daniel 3. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego understood this principle. And in the face of an angry king, they spoke some of the most powerful words in the Hebrew Bible. They said this, but even if he doesn't. You know, a few months ago, we talked about tattooable verses. If you're looking for one, that one. Just like that. Nothing else. But even if he doesn't. And I'm going to tell you why. With almost, well, yeah, with every story in our Bibles, we know the ending. We know what happens. If you read Daniel 3 before tonight, or maybe you've read it in the past, or, or maybe you have no idea what this is about, and this is your first time hearing it, let me tell you what happens. What happens at the end of the story is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stand up to the king, and not all is well. The king gets very angry. He turns the furnace up seven times hotter than it normally is, so hot, in fact, that when he ties them together and he goes to throw them in, that the guards that are with him are burnt alive, and they die, and they fall into the fire. But then something amazing happens. They watch, and King Nebuchadnezzar looks to his buddy and says, didn't we throw three men in the fire? And they said, yes, we did. And he said, why is there a fourth man, and why are they all walking around unchained? And they walk out. And King Nebuchadnezzar falls down before them and proclaims that their God is the one true God. And what happens is, is we read that story and we get stuck on the ending. We know that there's a fourth man in the fire. And we sang that powerful song tonight. There's another in the fire. Walking next to me. There's another in the waters holding back the sea. And I want you to hear tonight that that's okay. Because we do know the ending. But what I want to highlight tonight is they didn't. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had no idea what was going to happen. They said our God is able to save us. And my friends, he is. But even if he doesn't. All they knew was that it didn't matter what King Nebuchadnezzar did to them. Because they knew what they were convicted of. They were willing to stand up what, were, what they were convinced of regardless of the consequences. And I want to pose the question to you tonight. And to myself. Do I believe anything this strongly? Do I believe anything so strongly that I would be willing to stand in front of a king and say, go ahead and throw me in the fire? Because I stand firm on what I believe. They weren't going to allow fear to establish a boundary around their freedom. Instead, they allowed their freedom to overcome their fear. When they began to understand that serving their God gave them freedom, freedom from any affliction on earth, they were set free and fear no longer stood a chance. And so when they said, but even if he doesn't, 
what they were actually saying is, it doesn't matter what you do to me. Take my life. Take my hopes and dreams. Take my body. Do with it what you will, because as, as long as I belong to God, nothing you do to me can change that fact. They communicated to a world that did not share their same beliefs, that did not share their same worship of a God. They communicated to that culture and to that world that their faith was worth fighting for. That their faith was worth literally being pushed into a fire and being burned alive. And so I want to ask you another question tonight. What if we began to develop a faith that was this strong? Something that would endure the societal pressures and stand up against the harshest criticism and even something that would stand up in the face of death threats. We often read this story and we focus on the ending. And I want you to hear tonight that that's not a bad thing. We do serve a God that can and does save us from the fire. And in fact, I would actually argue that God saves us from more fires than we actually will ever know. And that someday when we stand before the Lord in all his glory and whatever that looks like, that we'll look back on our lives with him and he'll show us time and time and time and time again that we were put into the fires and he stood beside us and he didn't even let us know that it was hot. But what I am convinced of tonight is that we need to see that the true beauty of this statement, but even if he doesn't, is worth adopting into our lives. And so that really leads me to some of my closing statements for tonight. The question is how? How do we begin to develop a faith that endures? And I have four points that I want to go over with you, and they're going to be quick, so don't worry. But what I want you to know is they're going to disappoint you. So if you have Twitter, feel free to tweet. Or if you want to write these down, I would encourage you to do that. But, but I don't think that anything I'm going to say right now is going to blow your mind. But it's worth repeating. The first thing that we do when we ask the question, how is we ask God for more faith. And this really may seem elementary. It may seem very basic, but it's actually the building blocks of developing a faith that endures. Matthew 7, uh, verses 7 and 8 say this, Keep on asking and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. Everyone who seeks finds. And to everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. The amount of times that I have heard this verse misquoted and misrepresented drives me batty. <laughs> this does not mean that we go to God with every hope and desire and dream and he just lavishes, us, it, uh, lavishes it upon us as some cosmic vending machine that gives us what we want. What this verse tells us is that those who seek the Lord will find him. And you might be thinking to yourself, well, Luke, I've sure prayed a lot lately, and I don't feel the presence of God. That's also not what it means. It can mean that, and it does mean that. And sometimes when you pray that, God does show up, and he shows himself to us. But what this really, really points to, friends, is that when we seek a faith, and when we seek God in the way that we say, Father, I want to be more like you, and I want to be more like your son, Jesus Christ, that we are made that way, that that door is open, and that God shows us how to become better and more faithful servants. That's what it means. James 1.5 says it this way, If you need wisdom, ask, your, or ask our generous God, and he will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking. So the first step is to ask God. If you want a faith that endures, if you stand on the precipice of your life and you think, man, alive, when I step out this door this morning and I go to the university or I go to work and I work with a bunch of redneck guys that, that, that don't believe anything that I do or I work with a bunch of academics and really smart people that if they knew that I believed in the gospel, that they would begin to unpack all the inerrancies of what I believe, that they would begin to unpack all the ways that my faith is inaccurate and not worth believing in. 
If you have that feeling in your heart, I would say the first thing that you do is you go to the Father and you ask, God, help me to develop a faith that gives me strength, that endures. And when you do that, he delivers. And he begins to unfold things in your life that will begin to create that type of faith. The second is this. Study what the Bible reveals about faith. You want a place to start? Hebrews 11. Read there. And if you want to know more, I'd be happy to walk with you. I'd be happy to give you resources. But study the scripture. Look at how Jesus walked. Look at how Jesus developed a faith that he was able to lay in the garden of Gethsemane. And he was able to say, Father, your will should be done. I don't want this. I don't want to go to the cross. I don't want to die, but I'm going to because I love you and I love your children. That's the kind of faith that we want to, be, we want to model and so we go to the Bible and we study what it reveals about faith. Third, we wait on the Holy Spirit. The first two are what we do. The first two are how we engage. And as a world, in the world that we live in, let's be honest, how many of us like knowing exactly what to do? Let's, okay, how many people here have built uh, Ikea furniture? Anyone here built Ikea furniture? Would you like it if you ordered Ikea furniture and, and it came in a box, but in that box it had like maybe a thousand extra pieces that didn't go together and there was no instructions? Would, is there any sicko here that would love that? <laughs> it's probably somebody. They're just like, I'm not going to say anything. That would drive me nuts. See, we buy Ikea furniture because we don't have a lot of money. And, and, and every time I open it, it's like big kid, big kid Lego, and I'm very excited about it. But the point is, is that it would drive me crazy if I opened the box and there was no instructions and there was a bunch of extra pieces. And let's be honest, that's what life is kind of like. Except it's Ikea on steroids, and there's millions of extra pieces, and there's stuff there that's not even Ikea. There's like Yisk stuff mixed in there, which is like the really poor person's Ikea. You know what I'm saying? But the point is, is this third one, to wait on the Holy Spirit, I mean, it really means that we stop doing. And we stop, and we, we, we spend time in the presence of God. And we pray for His presence to come. We pray for the Holy Spirit to become alive in our life. Sometimes that means meditating, and I don't mean in the new agey sense, but I mean that, that time where you carve out of your calendar and your schedule to be quiet and still in front of the Lord. Maybe it means fasting. Maybe it means just simply submitting yourself or giving up some things in your life that are drawing you away from God. But waiting on the Holy Spirit will begin to develop a faith in you that endures. And finally, the fourth thing is this. Endure trials that come your way. I think so often we live in a life and we live in such a way that we look forward and we say, God, I want to be prepared for that monumental thing that's going to happen. I'm guilty of it too. Sometimes I look at my wife and, I, and my kids and I look at my life and I go, God, I want to be in a position that if some reason they were stripped from my life and I was left alone because of a, a tragic car accident or a sickness, that I would have developed a faith that's strong enough that I could stand on the other side of that and I could say, God, you are still worthy of my praise. And I can still lead your people because I trust you. That's the kind of faith I strive for. That's the kind of faith that I want. But if we believe that somehow we're just going to end up there, we're lying to ourselves. And so I encourage you to begin to endure the trials that you already have. Maybe it's the little things. Maybe it's waking up in the morning and your car doesn't start because it's minus 5,000 in Saskatchewan and you didn't plug in your block heater, but you get mad at God when really it was your fault. Or maybe it's that promotion you desperately want slash need at work and you don't get it. And in fact, instead of getting the promotion, you actually get a slip that says you're laid off. You begin to endure those trials. You begin to endure the small things in life so that when the big ones come, you're prepared. It's been said this way, if we desire to increase faith, we must consent to its testing. Let me say that again. If we desire to increase faith, we must consent to its testing. And I'll, and I'll, I'll kind of close with this scripture, Romans 8.28. Another tattooable verse. 
that I think maybe doesn't get the love and the attention and the exploration that it deserves. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. Yes, God works things out for good, but usually the good is on the other side of a very deep and dark chasm that's painful. And so if we want to begin to be men and women of faith that can stand in front of the king and say, you can burn me alive, I don't care, because my God alone is worth worshiping, and my trials are nothing in comparison for the glory that he has revealed upon and through Jesus Christ. When we begin to live that life, my friends, that's when God begins to work out for the good for each one of us. And so I want to close, I guess, with just the reminder that this life is going to ask a lot of you. It's going to ask you to chop a lot of wood, so to speak. It's going to require a lot of effort. And let me be clear, my father never gave me the option of not splitting the wood. It was never, it was never just, it, it was never something that I could go, you know what, dad, I really appreciate the offer to grow and like, yes, I want to be muscular and I want to be strong and, and I want to be able to stand on a stage someday and wield an axe. But, but actually, no, I'm good, thanks. I mean, that was back in the days my dad would hit me. I don't know if any of you grew up with dads like that. Not like beat me, that's that, I shouldn't say it like that and I don't mean to make it fun, but like he would hit me and like not in like a mean way, but like, psh. Let me just be clear, but, but that, was never, that was never an option for me. It was never an option to not chop the wood. And let me, let me be honest with you, friends, it's not an option for you. It's not an option for you to look at your life and to say, God, you know what, no, nah, I'm good. I don't need to be tested. I don't need to do the hard work. He says, I'm sorry, my child. You don't get a choice. The work needs to get done. The wood needs to get split. Your life needs to be lived. And I have a plan and a purpose for you that I'm going to see to completion. And so you have two choices. You can choose to swing and swing and swing with a dull axe that will inevitably frustrate you and make your life a living hell. Or you can choose to sharpen your axe by developing a faith that's strong enough to endure the trials. And then you begin to succeed and you begin to produce results in a life that's actually worth living. Let's pray together. Father, we're grateful for your word. We're grateful for the lessons that you teach us and the way, God, that you work through us. And Father, tonight I just simply pray that you would reveal ways to each one of us in this room how we can begin to develop faith that's stronger. God, that we would come to you to request your help, that we would study your word, that we would wait on your Holy Spirit, and God, that we would endure the trials that are already present. Father, I pray that each one of us tonight and going forward from tonight would know that it's worth sharpening ourselves. We praise you. In your name we pray. Amen.